It's getting cold outside, but what rabbits undergo to make your Angora sweater should make you think twice, exposing the cruelty of Angora products. Next on the PETA Podcast. Welcome to the PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this behind-the-scenes look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. Here we talk to the key players at PETA and the movement and ask them about how animal rights change their lives and how they stay motivated to make the world a better place for the animals. On today's episode, your soft angora garment, the cruelty to rabbits, a fashion don't. A PETA veterinarian takes fashion execs to see how their products are sourced in China. We went in there and we saw animals who were literally debilitated by infections of their eyes and their ears. Um, it was incredibly hot inside a lot of these warehouses, not to mention the stench, but incredibly hot. Um, so a lot of these rabbits who are temperature sensitive, rabbits are known for being very temperature sensitive animals, uh, were just, just laying there, just huffing and puffing, just unable to really move. And so, so hot, just salivating nonstop. And so they would get these infections under their mouths because there was so much saliva that they were producing in the heat. And they would get these skin infections and eye infections and and a lot of those, especially the ear infections, are highly contagious. So we saw a lot of this. It was rampant. Um, there's just not any control of the disease going on in these situations. When fashion execs thought their Angora products were just fine, Heather Raleigh, a veterinarian with PETA, brought them to China to see how the Angora rabbits were treated. It was jaw-dropping. The company, which we can't name, soon dropped Angora. Others should also, if they could only see. But the trip to the rabbit farms in China took a personal toll on the PETA veterinarian, Heather Rally. Oh, it was it was horrible. It was a really it was a really hard experience personally. This was the first time I've ever really been in a situation like that. Um as a veterinarian, obviously, I spent years of my life training specifically to be able to intervene in uh, suffering of this kind. And, uh, I was, I was just physically unable to do absolutely anything to help them. And it was, it was horrible. And I had to, I had to walk away from every one of those animals, hundreds of animals over the course of this, these few days for touring these farms who I, I, I was unable to help. Rally is one of the subjects of the new PETA Reveal series on PETA.org. You'll want to check out the video after you hear her talk about her journey to China on the PETA podcast. But first, thanks again for joining us here at the PETA podcast. Please share a link with friends. You know, it's important. Diseases shouldn't go viral, but podcasts should. Uh, let your friends know the animals have a voice on the PETA podcast. And if you're new to the podcast, by all means, be a binger, be a fierce binger. Meet PETA president and co-founder Ingrid Newkirk in episode one. She talks about animal rights and about an issue you need to understand, no kill shelters, good or bad. Hear it from Ingrid herself. And hear Ingrid's words on why mothers on the southern border should have never been separated from their children. That's on episode 24. A cow is a child is an immigrant. Issue has been forgotten, but uh, and a record number of children remain separated. But hear how PETA has helped. Wondering what PETA is doing to stop vivisection? Is that some new department at the school library? No, it's animal experimentation. Check it out. Episodes 11, 9, and 20 will help you get a big picture view about the fight against vivisection. Remember, if you're on Apple Podcasts, don't forget to rate and review the show. It helps the algorithm know that PETA has a podcast on the issues important to you. Now, if you really want to help the animals, you can always hit the Donate Now button at PETA.org. And if you're high tech and have Amazon's Alexa, it's as easy as saying, Alexa, donate to PETA. And now to our episode. 
Heather Rowley is a PETA veterinarian and featured in the new video series, PETA Reveals, on PETA.org. On this podcast, she talks about her evolution as an activist, how her connection to animals began as a young girl, and how she continues to fight for the animals working for PETA. But it was that trip to China to help fashion execs see the cruelty to Angora rabbits that she soon won't forget. Here's my conversation with PETA veterinarian Heather Rowley on the PETA Podcast. Heather, thank you very much for being part of the PETA Podcast. You know, I I checked out the PETA Reveals, and the idea is that people will hear us talk about PETA Reveals and and will be so compelled to, you know, by the conversation we have that they'll go to PETA Reveals at PETA.org and say, oh, that's what she's talking about. So we're going to get to that. But, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, this... The podcast talks about people at PETA and uh, talks about what motivates them and what keeps them going. And so you're a veterinarian. How Mm -hmm. long have you been a veterinarian and and why did you become a vet uh, of all things? You could have been you could have been anything in the world. Indeed. (laughs) So, um, yeah, I I have always, always wanted to be a veterinarian. My mother will tell you I popped out that way. so I always knew at least that I would work with animals. And I think uh, my family, seeing that passion in me at a very young age, they fostered me in what they felt was sort of the best uh, professional direction, which was, of course, towards veterinary medicine. So, um, yeah, I fell in love with vet med very early in life. Um, you know, those Animal Planet shows, watching vets do surgeries and all sorts of crazy things. Um, and I was just fascinated. I loved it. And uh, I've always wanted to just care for animals. Did you have a lot of companion animals growing up, too? And I kind did. Of thing? Yes, they were very tolerant of vet bills. My parents were. Um, and actually... I, so now I do work primarily with wildlife campaigns for PETA, and my passion has always really been in wildlife work. And um, so I became known quite early on in my childhood as the little local wildlife rehabber. And so mm-hmm. once you have a reputation for that, you, you never know what's going to show up on your doorstep. <laughs> and my parents were very, very, very tolerant. They would, we would always take them to the vet. And um, if it was appropriate, they would, you know, teach me how to care for them. And then we would eventually take them to rehabilitation and release sites so they could be returned to the wild. You're talking about injured birds or yeah, maybe, primarily a rac- injured birds. maybe a raccoon or a small mammal or something? Yeah, when it came to small mammals, uh, we would always send them to rehabbers. And, and of course, you're supposed to send them to rehabbers because there are people, even for the birds, who do this professionally and are very competent. It was a bit of a different time when I was a kid. <laughs> and um, so there were yeah, definitely the occasional, mostly doves, um, that I would raise. And so I became uh, pretty passionate about wildlife, um, some you know reptiles as well, lizards and snakes and things. Um, but yeah, I was always really into reptiles, really into birds, really into wildlife in general. It must have been strange because if you grew up in Los Angeles, I mean, Los Angeles isn't exactly, you know, wildlife uh, kingdom. Uh, right. I mean, but I guess there is, I kind of, a, you know, there are, the, the animals were displaced by the urbanness of LA. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually. Even more so, I think, um, in some ways, animals need help, you know, with human animal, human wildlife conflict that happens in cities. They're struggling to survive amidst the urban jungle. Um, mm-hmm. And so, yeah, a car hit, being hit by car or, you know, for birds, windows are a really big problem. They don't right. see them. And so that's, that's a big cause of death for wild birds, cats, um, and other things that the human population brings with it. So lots of challenges uh, to wildlife. So you grew up animal loving and the you're on the, the vet med track. You're a kid and you get to veterinary school. And it must have shocked you somewhat to find that just because your people are vets or into vet med, they're not necessarily animal rights type people. That must have shocked you. Yeah. Yeah, I I definitely went into veterinary school with a sort of different career goal than most veterinarians, just wanting to do wildlife alone. Most vets go in to do cat and dog clinical medicine. And so I always knew I wanted to do wildlife. Um, And at the time, I had already been involved in activism and uh, just 
felt really compelled to do something bigger than uh, just, you know, treating animals and giving vaccines and prescribing flea medications in clinic. So, um, yeah, I always really wanted to do something in more of an advocacy role and finding that through my veterinary career, um, not only that there weren't a lot of vet students who were interested in the advocacy path or knew anything about it, um, Mm -hmm. but that you know, the the work that we were asked to do, uh, whether it was through rotations on dairy farms or through university laboratories, um, was it was all really shocking to see how entrenched the veterinary industry was um, in what I felt were, uh, you know, complacent, you know, in basically animal abuse and neglect type industries. And um, it was hard to have to go through that. I, I'm really grateful that I did because it gave me a perspective to be able to, I feel, really formulate opinions and um, really go after those industries, which is a part of what I do with PETA now. Um, but yeah, it was, it was eye-opening for sure. Early on in our conversation, you said that, you know, you were born this way. I guess that's uh, Lady Gaga's line, right? Um, <laughs> but, uh, but what is it about activism when you are you're, you're you're torn or you're 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 directed self-directed in a way is it really kind of like a i know is it a god-given thing or was there something mm. that happened that made you kind of like snap and say oh i've got to do this for the animals can you can you identify yeah that sort of moment in your life? Yeah, actually I can. Um, So I say I was born this way in the sense that I was definitely born with a passion and deep, deep love for animals, but I definitely wasn't born an activist. Um, I I sort of evolved into an activist and my awakening really kind of came later in life, actually around sort of the time I was entering veterinary school. And it was primarily credited to a film called The Cove. Mm-hmm. which is about the dolphin slaughter in Japan. And this film mm-hmm. came out right before I entered veterinary school. And I had already been doing at this stage uh, several years of marine mammal rescue and rehabilitation work along the coast of California. And that was my, and remains my deepest passion. And I you know, was going to veterinary school to do this work and considered myself a member of the marine mammal scientific community for what it's worth. And then I saw this film and in 90 minutes, it just it was not only devastating, it was Mm. just to learn about the actual issues themselves. The issues were devastating, but I was really uh, disappointed in myself because I realized that I knew nothing, despite, you know, considering myself a member of this scientific community, I knew nothing about the fact that this, these atrocities were happening to dolphins on the other side of the planet. I'd, I'd spent several years trying to rescue and rehabilitate and release them and save these animals. And then to learn that this was happening, I didn't even know about it. I was just, I was shocked. Um, I was really disappointed in myself primarily. So it was sort of the moment when I opened my eyes and <clears throat> I realized that I'm, I was never going to be um, <clears throat> complacent <clears throat> in this by fact of by the fact that I was ignorant about it again. Um, so I sort of made a transition and uh, became active at that stage and have really never turned back. <laughs> and and I gather that's your dog reacting to your, your, your uh, revelation. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. That was my dog in the background. <laughs> that, that's all right. I mean, for a know, bit of attention. <laughs> it's just that when you know, someone will talk that way, that sensitively about animals. Another animal is is surely to respond, and and your dog did right there. So yeah, I, I, yeah, I, absolutely. I understand. Also, from watching the video, I can tell that you are of mixed race. And did that have any bearing, or did that uh, complicate things as as you were trying to find your activist voice? You saw this movie. Uh, you, your parents were really made sure that you were, you know, they accommodated your your animal concerns and the vet med track. But did the, re- the mixed racing have, uh, did it help or hinder or, you know, how did that play into yeah. your activism? Yeah, um, not tremendously, although, you know, I would say I feel fortunate in a lot of ways to be mixed race and to be surrounded by a lot of diversity and also just growing up in Los Angeles. 
Um, I was surrounded by diversity. It's a very big melting pot of a place. Um, mm. And so having, I really feel that having exposed that exposure to ethnic diversity in particular, it maybe helps instill a degree of compassion and sort of understanding and, and a lot of issues that we deal with with animals and in activism um, may appear to be sort of shrouded in this sort of ethnic issue or sort of characterized as an ethnic issue. And in reality, we're all human beings. And so I think that it actually allows me to relate to people having um, sort of also my myself being mixed race, but also having the life history that I've had and experience that I've had dealing with a, a variety of backgrounds of people and um, diverse ethnic backgrounds and cultural backgrounds. So I think that really ultimately we're all human beings. And so, and in a lot of these issues that we deal with are just about being able to reach people and um, really relate to individuals in their heart and um, mm -hmm. convey these messages. And that's, you know, where I tried to come at with the Peter Reveals video as well. And um, I just try to be as real and as human as possible. And I think that it, you know, that's the best way to to influence hearts and minds and behavior. So when you talk about mixed race, uh, which which uh, ethnicities are, are, are you referring to now? As primarily Filipino and Italian. Filipino and Italian. Oh, well, yeah, so, like we have and, and my kids are Filipino and Irish. I actually have Irish in, in me as well. I'm a big mutt. <laughs> All right. So, well, the, 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 what I was trying to get at is that when you become vegan or when you, you're some of your cultural things, um, you know, conflict with, you know, your activism. Was that ever a, a, an issue? Um, you know, I'm really fortunate. My family, uh, yeah, we definitely have differing political opinions and opinions about differing opinions about a lot of things in life. Uh, but they overall fundamentally have, I have always been so deeply supported no matter what, um, in what I do, because I always, you know, I act from like a, from a very passionate place and they see that. Um, so I, you know, I, I'm fortunate that you know, I really haven't, at least from, you know, my family, from that perspective, I really haven't uh, dealt with a lot of um, challenges in that regard. However, mm -hmm. I mean, I would say the challenge that I've probably dealt with the most is, is dealing with the veterinary community, um, the professional mm -hmm. community that I'm a part of. And, you know, there aren't a lot of us who work in advocacy at all, let alone in animal rights. So um, it is a bit of a challenging space. And we def yeah, I definitely face a bit of adversity there for the work that I do. Um, but it's all worth it. <laughs> It's it's good to know the veterinarians are much tougher on you than the uh, Filipinos and their uh, pork lechon <laughs> or anything like that. So that's yeah. that's good to know, and that that you've dealt with that. And yeah. so now you've been with Peta how long now? Been with Peta about four and a half years. Tell me about this your role in dealing with companies in in terms of the Peter reveals video and the the issue of Angora Angora comes from rabbits they produce this fur that create what kind of products and how did you get involved in this what, what yeah what kind of what kind of products come from the rabbits the angora rabbits the fur that is used from the angora rabbit is uh, very soft and sort of silky and has a, a soft quality and so it's it's used similar to the way that wool from sheep is used um, and it's used to make primarily to make clothing this particular company had, you know, PETA Asia had conducted an investigation the previous year, the year before I went out to China on the Angora industry. And it had been really, it had lifted the veil on this, this, this product that nobody really knows what it is. And I think that's why it had such a powerful impact on the industry as a whole, because you know, Angora, nobody knows what Angora is. Is it synthetic? Is it from a plant or an animal or you know, <laughs> nobody knows. So I think that in addition to the footage that was obtained of these rabbits being strapped down and the way that this fur is collected, uh, just being ripped off of their bodies while they're alive, and it's horrifying and you can hear their screams, the, the footage itself is horrifying. Um, but then, you know, it also was just so shocking to people to realize, oh, all along I've been supporting, you know, something this horrifying without even realizing it, it's, a, it's a fiber that comes from an animal. Um, so it really shook the industry, I think. 
Well, I mean, but Angora, uh, so it creates what sweaters and jackets. It's primarily known mm-hmm. for its warmth, right? I mean, yes, yeah. And so, what what is a like the the most common thing that would be made from Angora that people would say buy, and the next time they pick it up at a at a department store, they're going to have to think twice. Primarily, you'll find it in sweaters, um, other garments. So uh, you can find it in some uh, um, blankets and things as well. So um, yeah, anytime you're uh, buying a garment of any kind, you should everyone should be reading labels to make sure that they're not inadvertently supporting this industry. Um, like, you know, it's really cl- declined a lot. I mean, we had you know 330, I think over 330 retailers have stopped sourcing Angora after this investigation. Um, so it's you know the, fortunately. A lot of people are not selling it anymore, but it's still out there and it's still prevalent. And people don't realize, yeah, when I go out and buy a sweater that I might be supporting this type of animal suffering. Yeah. And it's especially important now because this is the time when the weather is starting to change and people are looking for warmth. And, you know, they're, so they look at down, they look at wool, they look at merino wool, they look at this Angora thing, and they should really stop and think about it. So in, in your Peter Reveals talk, you go to China, and uh, as I recall, the company wasn't sure that they were doing anything wrong. They said, oh, well, we have a supplier, and the suppliers are all right. So there's a lot of that mm-hmm. kind of ignorance that goes on, right? Yeah, that's a big thing that we struggle with, is just convincing companies that you know these investigations that we're doing, it's not a one-off occurrence. Like these, This is industry-wide, these are very common practices that we find. And so a lot of times when we show a company investigation footage, they might think, oh, well, not on my farm. Um, but the reality is that it, it it more than very likely is happening on the farm that you are supplying from. And so we we were talking to them about it. They agreed. Um, you know, they had been told that that rabbits on their farms aren't being plucked and that they're being raised humanely. And so, you know, we they they took us up on an offer to escort them around those farms. And, and I was able to, to do that and actually to, to talk to them, to show them physically in person why these animals are suffering, how they're suffering. Um, and yeah, after that, fortunately, they they agreed with us wholeheartedly and yeah. they um, also stopped sourcing Angora completely. All right. So let's let's go back just a, a bit. So the, the companies in New York or LA or someplace in the United States, and they're thinking, oh, well, we, we get our, our Angora supplies from these folks in China. And they, they tell us they're, everything's fine. Everything's on the up and up. And you challenged them. And so you took them to the, the farms and describe what you saw. You, you showed the video on Peter Reveals. And hopefully after people hear our conversation, that they will go to Peter Reveals and they'll see, you know, exactly what you saw. But describe, describe it. For, for our listeners now, you have the, the company people in tow visiting the farms, maybe for the first time, looking mm-hmm. at how the, how the rabbits are being treated. And what was it like? What, what, what did you see? We visited a number of farms and they were various sizes, some of them smaller, some of them massive and these huge warehouses. Um, and what we saw was really consistent across all of them. It was primarily a lot of disease when you have animals in these highly overcrowded and highly unsanitary conditions, you're, you're just going to have a lot of illness and particularly infectious disease, which then of course they transmit to each other. And so you see, a, a, we went in there and we saw animals who were literally debilitated by infections of their eyes and their ears. Um, it was incredibly hot inside a lot of these warehouses not to mention the stench, but incredibly hot. Um, So a lot of these rabbits who are temperature sensitive, rabbits are known for being very temperature sensitive animals, uh, were just just laying there, just huffing and puffing, just unable to really move. And so, so hot, just salivating nonstop. And so they would get these infections under their mouths because there was so much saliva that they were producing in the heat. And they would get these skin infections and eye infections and 
and a lot of those, especially the ear infections, are highly contagious. So we saw a lot of this. It was rampant. Um, there's just not a, any control of the disease going on in these situations. Not to mention, none of these animals were able to be uh, were euthanized. So the farmers, mm. I think that they thought this is what we wanted to hear from them, um, but they were adamant that not a single animal was ever killed on this farm, and that included animals who were very who were so near death that euthanasia was the, really the only humane option for these animals. And I. I begged these farmers to let me euthanize some of these animals. And the answer was always no. Um, they they yeah. just were adamant about it. So, um, yeah, it was really sad. You're a healer. You know, when you see uh, animals in need, animals in pain, animals suffering, animals who are unhealthy, you want to heal, but you couldn't. And you couldn't even ease their pain. How did it make you p yeah. feel personally to see this? Oh, it was, it was horrible. It was a really, it was a really hard experience personally. This was the first time I've ever really been in a situation like that. Um, as a veterinarian, obviously I spent years of my life training specifically to be able to intervene in, uh, suffering of this kind. And, uh, I was, I was just, physically unable to do absolutely anything to help them. And it was, it was horrible. And I had to, I had to walk away from every one of those animals, hundreds of animals over the course of this, these few days for touring these farms who I, I, I was unable to help. And what did it mean to the, the, the business people, the, 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 the corporations, the companies who accompanied you to on this trip when they saw your reaction to the animals who were diseased and helpless and suffering, what were they, how were they react? I think they were shocked because they really believed that these animals were being properly cared for. You know, these people, their hearts were in the right place. They really, they don't want to see animal suffering, let alone at, at their hands because of their company practices. So uh, when they saw this, I think they were, you know, they, they understood you know, obviously they saw my reaction to it. They heard my explanation of why, of what's wrong and why the animals are suffering, but they could also see it for their own eyes. And it, it is, it was powerful. Um, no one could deny, you know, you almost didn't need me there explaining why these animals are suffering so much because it's, it's evident to anyone with a heart when you see an animal in that kind of pain and misery that that is wrong. And so I, you know, I think that they were definitely moved. And I think they were shocked. And I think that's a reflection of, of what they decided ultimately to do. Yet at the same time, this is a rare occurrence. People are in New York in the, the garment industry, making decisions, buying and jobbing and doing all that and selling these products. And they don't really think about, and unless they hear, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind, they, they get assurances that things are okay. But it's rare that you'll have corporations accompanying someone like you from PETA to a farm, right? I mean, this doesn't happen all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, very, very rare. So we give them a lot of credit for this because it, it, we, we need more people to be, to care this much about the products that they're sourcing, more companies to care. And of course, we get them to care by consumers caring. And making their voices heard. So um, that's obviously why PETA runs the campaigns that we do. But yeah, absolutely. They they get a lot of credit for taking taking these this level of action. You can't name the company, right? Is that, is that right. still the case? <laughs> okay, so you True. can't. And that's because of some kind of an agreement that PETA has with the company? Yes. And so, but they, they aren't using Angora. They're not sourcing from uh, farms like this. They're not using it at all. Uh, but they have used or have turned to an alternative. And I, I gather this is one company out of how many? There's still dozens that still use Angora, that still use these suppliers, that still do this kind of cruelty, right? Or yes. they condone this kind of cruelty in their products. Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, like I said, we've had a lot of success. A tremendous success in getting, I mean, just showing this horrifying video footage from the PETA Asia investigation has changed most of the companies we've spoken to over the years has changed their minds. Uh, but we're still, yeah, we're still actively working on 
um, discussions with companies who are still sourcing Angora, um, it is still a very big problem. And and while they don't, while this one particular company doesn't use this supplier, the supplier hasn't shut down. They're probably continuing to sell it to the bad companies, right? Yes, um, we have every reason to believe that they are. Uh, we don't. I mean, I don't know personally whether or not, you know, how much the suppliers themselves have been impacted by this. Obviously, uh, the farms are open and operating. And so we would certainly assume that that Angora is going to other companies who are who are still purchasing that product and who are still selling it to un, unknowing consumers in most cases. I mean, the fact is that they have they haven't shut down. They're not they haven't stopped. They're still getting rabbits. They're still skinning them, selling their fur. And so mm-hmm. it really is a matter of going after all the companies. And you probably have just scratched the surface in terms of trying to convince companies to change, right? Yeah. In fact, if any, for anyone who's listening, um, you can go online and you can find action alerts to sign that we still we ha- currently have active on several companies that you know, we're really, we're trying to get them to change their practices. So yeah, we, we're we still very active on that front. One of the things about your Peter Reveals talk is that it, it was, it came across, it was very touching, it had great video and none of this was undercover video. They just, they just allowed the supplier and the corporations allowed you to take video, right? Yep, exactly. And so it's all yeah. out in the open. It's all under, right under our noses and only having a moral conscience and say, no, we can't do that. And so one company did, but others continue. And so one thing that got me about your, your Peter reveals is that uh, you didn't want it to be a total downer. There was something positive that came out of this and something empowering. And that is that consumers, when they see this video, they can do something and they can realize the power that they have. And Mm -hmm. it's not insignificant, this power they have. I mean, if people said, I don't want to buy Angora because of what Angora represents, you could not just shut down the companies that sell Angora, but you can shut down the suppliers as well, right? Yeah. Consumer power is absolutely everything. When it comes to changing business practices, companies listen to their customers. Um, We are their constituents. We are the ones saying supporting or not supporting every single time we put a dollar down on the table for anything. You are essentially casting a vote that you want more of that in the future. And so, you know, that power is, I mean, it's, it's tremendous. People really highly underestimate it. So, yeah, that was the big message that I wanted everyone to get out of that talk is that you don't have to go to China. You don't have to escort companies around Angora Rabbit Fur Farms to make a difference here. You really just have to pay attention to what you're purchasing and make conscious decisions. And and that is that is the best way for the average person to change the world every day. And it really is a, a, a supply and demand issue. I mean. Uh, they wouldn't go to Angora rabbits and use them for clothing if there wasn't a demand for it. But there is a demand for the silky feel of the Angora fur. And it's not just fur, but it's they they weave it into a a fabric, Mm -hmm. into a sweater. And it's the warmth, it's the, the luster, and it's all that. And it's fashionable. And I mean... Can you look at a fashionable Angora sweater and not be reminded of the pain you saw in China? Those images will be seared in my mind forever. And I think, honestly, you know, if people knew how just incredible the the vegan tech, the technology is these days to create synthetic vegan fibers and synthetic, even synthetic furs, synthetic leather um, it's it's everything, every one of those things that you already mentioned and more. I mean, we have mm. the ability to to just synthesize all of this. We don't need animals to be fashionable or to be warm. Um, it's just a different day and age now. So it's time to move beyond it. And I think once people realize that, you know, I can do this without harming animals, then they 
I mean, that's a, that's a life changer, you know, for everyone, animals included. It's a world changer. And I, I think we're seeing that now more companies really embracing vegan synthetic alternatives to animals. You did all this work. You, you took the company to China. You saw and you show them what happens with their supplier. And yet this is, like I said, you know, a moment ago, this is just one company. Uh, so in, in some ways, it, you know, to try if you got this one company that, that can't be named to change. But it's still such an incredible uphill fight to change other companies. So I guess my question is, what keeps you motivated? to continue the fight? What keeps you motivated to, to not give up? Really, it's being able to be a tangible part, to play a tangible role in so many tremendous victories and, and not, to, not to discredit or discount them just because it's one company. Um, I, you know, I really feel grateful that every single day I get to do the work that I get to do and to make a tangible difference in animal lives. Um, and we see, you know, every, every week we have victories in, you know, various departments, you know, not just on the, you know, fashion and um, furs and skins front, but on every front where humans are, are just abusing animals in tremendously awful ways. Um, and we're, we're making a real difference. And I think that I just, for me, that that's where I get my motivation is being able to be a part of it. Every single one of these little, how, no matter how little they are, every single one of, one of these victories is making a difference in the world. And, um, and I know that if we just continue pushing forward, that we will, we will see phenomenal change. We will change the world for the better. Well, Heather Rally, I appreciate you being here on the PETA podcast. I hope people have uh, listened to your words here on the podcast and will be compelled to go to PETA.org and see your video uh, and hear your story and see your see you tell your story because it's accompanied by these uh, very graphic images that I think make the case that Angora uh, is is a cruel fabric and if you're a consumer you should be you should be just saying no to angora especially if you know what happens to the rabbits who give up their fur for the material yeah. so so heather rally PETA veterinarian thank you very much for being on the PETA podcast thank you my pleasure Heather Raleigh, a veterinarian with PETA, talking about her trip to China with those fashion execs who, after seeing the cruelty to rabbits, changed their policy on Angora. They stopped using Angora to make their products. See what Heather showed them on her PETA Reveals talk. It's a special video on PETA.org. See the video and take action. Contact clothing companies about Angora. And don't forget your power as an individual consumer. When the weather gets colder, remember, you always have a choice. The animals don't. Hey, you can contact us at PETA.org. Find me on Twitter at Emil Amok. That's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K. Or on Amok.com. Once again, thank you for listening check out all our episodes on Apple Podcasts, where you can rate and review the show. It helps get the word out about the issues you care about. And don't forget, you can help the animals and PETA, especially if you have Amazon's Alexa. Just say, Alexa, donate to PETA. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on the PETA Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Emil Guillermo.